Yo, what's up, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to another The Shy Review. This is season five, episode seven, entitled Angels. I'm sorry I missed the last two reviews for the last two episodes. I ended up getting COVID, but I am back. So if this is your first time coming to my channel, welcome. If you are a returning family member, you already know what it is and what it will be. Now, let me just go on the record to say that this was probably my favorite episode of the season. Even though it was super emotional, it did make me cry. I'm not going to lie. I shed some tears like a lot of y'all did. But um, I, I, told, I loved it. I loved the episode. It was a really, really great episode. So we open up with Keisha and Emmett. And they are getting it in on the kitchen table. Emmett and Keisha's sex scenes are top tier and i personally can't think of anything better to be doing at 8 a.m in the morning when you're in a fresh relationship when you're getting your stuff together they say the best part of waking up is having folders in your cup but i beg to differ i beg to differ but that's just me so tiffany decides to use her key and walk into emmett's house unannounced and oh dear baby girl get an eyeful but that's what she gets. All of a sudden, now that she knows that Emmett is back with Keisha, she wants to use her key. She hasn't used her key any other time, yet she wants to use it now. Mm -hmm. I see what's going on. Talking about it's 8 in the morning. Really? Yes, really. Yes, really. She was shocked, but it looked like someone is missing M's third, you know, Emmett's third leg. And it's not Keisha. But um, <laughs> Keisha... Her, she readily excuses herself and Tiff and Emmett talk about why she's there. She basically tells him that she's there to get EJ. I told you I was coming early and he was like, you know, I, he was just bewildered. You know what I'm saying? He getting it in all of a sudden your ex-wife is in your kitchen. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, you know, he forgot. Tiffany and Keisha still haven't had any words, but we do see in the preview for next week that they're going to be having a conversation and we'll get into that when I do the review for the, um, the preview. So, um, Tiffany lets him know that there is a parent teacher conference and he better not be late. Of course, Emmett forgot, but stated that he would be there and he would not be late. He also tells Tiffany not to take her anger out on Keisha and she tells him not to tell her what to do with the attitude. So Jake, he, Finally tells Trig about Gemma being pregnant. And Trig is pissed, of course, especially being that he asked Jake if Gemma was pregnant. And Jake lied and told him no. This is after Jake comes to the realization that their mother isn't coming back. And she is the one who told him that he needed to tell his brother. So <clears throat> it was interesting because Trig instantly stated how this would make him look in the eyes of the public. He mentions the same sentiments again a few scenes later with Jake when he was basically asking him, like, I need you to act like you got a baby coming. And so although we know that Trid cares, he's acting as if he's more concerned about his image and less about what it means for Jake's life becoming a father at such a young age. And Jake lets him know that. Gemma and Marcus, I absolutely love their relationship. I'm sure no parent wants their teen child to be bringing a child into the world but he has handled this situation with such care and respect. And he respects Gemma's decision. You know, he asked her, basically, have you weighed out all the pros and cons, all your options? And she's just like, you know, she know what she wants to do. You know, he lets her know that he's going to be there with her every step of the way. And he has her back. And, you know, uh, she was like, you know, Jake's going to do his part, too. And Mark was like, he better. And I was like, I know that's right. Like y'all good. You could you we know that Gemma and Marcus are well off, but I think that also Marcus knows that Jake really does care about his daughter and he's gonna do whatever needs to be done on his end. So we get to Lene and Kevin and they're playing video games um in his room. He invites her to his game tournament, but she wasn't really feeling it at first. Now let me say this. I've seen many people state that they don't like Lene's attitude. And for me, I believe her attitude is expected. All the kids, for the most part, on this show have some type of attitude because they have some tumultuous situations going on in their lives. For Lene, 
the one person that she truly loves and dependent solely on is going to prison for life, for murder, her, you know, her brother. So I don't expect her to have a bubbly attitude right now. I believe that Lene is grateful that she's able to stay with Kevin, but I don't expect her to have like this bubbly personality. Um, Kevin lets her know that the tournament was going to be worth $25,000. And honestly, <laughs> I love this episode and, and, you know, I have no complaints. I absolutely love this season. I know some people were saying that this season is not good, but it's been great for me. But I am trying to understand what is Kevin's character arc this season. I'm not sure what it is. It seems like everybody else have like a strong storyline. I don't know what his is. And, you know, I'm trying not to look too deep into it because I'm honestly, I'm just grateful that Kevin is happy this season. And I, I guess that's enough. So Deja and Shad, I like Deja, but I was not a fan of the Q&A she put Shad through. I, I, I was not. I, just for me personally, I have a personal issue when someone cannot be their authentic selves in order to meet your family. Like she didn't want him to, you know, talk about him being in prison. He, he had to know like certain things about her family members. And I didn't like that. Like, and I'm one of those people that made me think about a situation um, with my boyfriend at the time. And he was two years older than me. And he <laughs> he had two kids by two different women. So, of course, there were certain people in my family, you know, I guess who envisioned me dating a specific type of guy. And I didn't care what they thought. This was somebody who I absolutely adored. I loved. And I'm like, his personal business has nothing to do with y'all. You're just meeting him. And, you know, I have some people in my family who are loud just for no reason. And they want to know what you do and what. And it's like, wait a minute. First of all, this is a man. And you're going to treat him and acknowledge him as such. You're not talking to a boy. So we're not going to do that. And so I just, <clears throat> excuse me, that scene just really made me, really made me upset. So, like, even with the family dinner, you know, the sister was extremely rude, especially when shot you know, blurted out that he had been incarcerated and the mood shifted and the judgment was definitely on 10. And after shot so eloquently put them in their place, they just father seemed pleased with him, but I didn't like it. It was almost as if shot had to prove himself worthy to them. And I just didn't like that. Even though the father was like, you know, happy or whatever at the end, but it's like, who are, who are you that he has to prove himself worthy to date your daughter. So I love that he just reiterated the fact that, you know, he loves, you know, his daughter as long as he has her by his side. But I just, like I said, even though I like Deja, I would have appreciated it more if she would have went in initially with allowing, you know, Rashad to just be himself. So, <laughs> yeah, baby, Tiffany, Emmett, and Miss Green in this damn classroom. A ratchet ass mess. It was so chaotic, yet real as hell. <laughs> Tiffany's attitude was already trash. Her attitude was already trash. She brought up how Emmett was being messy for effing her best friend. And Emmett let her know that he and Keisha has been effing since high school. It was Miss Green's face for me. Okay, Miss Green's face displayed that she was highly appalled by the conversation that was taking place in her classroom. She wanted to meet with Tiffany and Emmett because while EJ is a great student, he's having difficulty keeping up and she needs his parents to provide the extra help that he needs in order to bring him up to par. This season, I will say that we have definitely witnessed Emmett stepping his game up in the father department. We've actually witnessed him spend time with his kids quite frequently we've seen him actually read to his children and i don't remember seeing tiffany ever crack open nan book to read to ej and i thought it was so interesting how she was questioning emmett's parenting skills when we have not seen her be the best parent at all this season like you living with this dude and i understand you didn't want she didn't want to live with her mom her mom wasn't that bad to me like her mom wasn't that bad her mom was just like you, you just not finna come here and do nothing you know what I'm saying? So I don't, anyway, she ain't been the best mom in my personal opinion, but I just found it very interesting how she was trying to down Emmett for the things that 
he has done, is doing, and even some of the things that he's not doing. He's not reading to EJ every day, but he is reading to him. I didn't see Tiffany say, well, I read to him at least two days out the week. She didn't say nothing. So to let me know you're not doing anything when it comes to your child because you're so busy, you know, in your new relationship. So I understand that Tiffany is speaking from a place of hurt. I I, I get it. But baby girl, you didn't want to work out things in your marriage, which she had every right not to giving the situation. However, you got to, she got to live with that. She has to live with the choice that she made. And you know, she, she has to understand that she can't dictate who Emmett decides to be with. So Miss Green let them both know that she doesn't care what they have going on. She doesn't care. And that their son is the priority, not them. And so they decided to come, you know, to an agreement or come together for the sake of EJ. So we see Keisha in her dorm room and she's having difficulty um, just balancing being a mom, being a student and living in the th- and living in the dorms. Now, initially, I thought that Keisha was living in the family dorms and maybe not every school has that. But it appears that she's living in a regular dorm. Like I went I went to Florida and m University and there were certain on-campus apartments that were for families that were for people who had children so that's where I thought that's kind of like the the atmosphere or the environment I thought she was living in but it seems like she's living in a regular dorm so her neighbor is blasting their music Ronnie won't stop crying and Keisha can't take it so she meets with her counselor who advises her to get a place where she has support and where she can do her work in a you know in a quiet environment so she talks it over with Emmett and they decide to live together But before that, Emmett and Tiffany are coming up with a plan to help um, EJ. And Emmett lets Tiffany know that he wants to leave Smokies to his son. Like, he wants to give them an inheritance. He wants something to pass down to him, to them. And she asked him why he never told her. And he says he never, you know, had the chance. And at that moment, Keisha walks in and Emmett gets up uh, to help her. I think that... Tiffany can see his change she's just not ready to admit it just yet I think it's very difficult to admit that you can see a man change and he didn't change for you or maybe you left too abruptly in the relationship because you were hurt and that's very understandable but I think when you look at the dynamic with Emmett and and Tiffany yes Emmett did some effed up stuff you know what I'm saying he married her um just basically so you know the whole thing with with Dom Like, so she wouldn't find out, Dom wouldn't say nothing. So I don't think he was ready for marriage, but he married her. And, and, you know, he didn't cheat while he was married, but it was like at the same time, you married this woman without her knowing the full extent of your relationship dynamic with your coworker. And you got this girl all in Dom's face. So I completely understand where Tiffany was coming from, but I think when Emmett began to make that change where he only wanted to be with her and Tiffany was like, well, I want an open marriage. At that point, they should have ended their marriage because both of y'all are in a marriage and y'all both want different things, but they let it linger. And I do believe that Tiffany definitely still loved Emmett, but she was hurt and not processing that hurt effectively has led them to where they, you know what I'm saying, where they are now. So Keisha comes in and so um, she asked Emmett if they can talk later and Tiffany tells her that y'all could talk in front of me and and Keisha says it can wait I said Tiffany you tried it Tiffany you tried it no they cannot talk in front of you sis it's none of your business and so Emmett tells her that she needs to stop being mean to Keisha like she she gonna have to get on the good foot and like get with the program and so she replies that it's a lot to digest which I believe is the God honest truth and he tells her well you better get to digesting like you bet that hands down that was the best line of the uh, of the episode hands down meaning Keisha isn't going anywhere and even though Tiff and Emmett were married I always believe that there was something special that he has always carried for Keisha and his actions always proved that like regardless of where they were as far as in a relationship in a friendship when she was you know when she went missing with her recovery Emmett was a constant um presence in her life during that time and and and, you know sometimes it's just like that with certain people sometimes it's not romantic sometimes it is but there are certain people 
who will just always have a place in your heart or you will always have a genuine love and concern for them. And we were able to see that with, um, to me with Emmett and Keisha. So Gemma and Maisha, I absolutely <laughs> adore them. I absolutely love them. Their friendship has been the thing I never knew I needed on the shot. So Maisha was rehearsing and Gemma stops the music, letting her know that she needs to work on her stage presence. And my Aisha responded with, do you ever have anything nice to say? And it was the way that she said it, it was so funny. And so an envelope catches Gemma's attention. And it was from a college that wanted my Aisha to visit their campus. My Aisha informs Gemma that college is her mother's dream for her. And even though Gemma gets on her last nerves, she much rather be doing music with her. She asked Gemma a fair question. How is she going to manage her and be someone's mother? And Gemma lets her know that women do it all the time. And it was so funny because I'm looking at Gemma say that. And I'm like, baby girl, you have no idea. That because you're you're pregnant, so the baby isn't here. And it is great to have that kind of hope. But the reality is you're young. It, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be some struggle there, especially trying to manage someone's, you know what I'm saying, musical career. But I was like, you know, we all have you know, those, uh, those high hopes, especially when we can't really see the reality of some things. And so, like I said, they had a cute moment and my Isha lets Gemma know that her music has gotten a lot better since they linked up and Gemma thanks her for, for trusting her. So Trig and Tierra, they discuss Jake becoming a father and she lets him know that they have to support him and how she wishes that she would have been the one to get pregnant. I was not expecting that at all. I, I was like, "You what? You, um, how you gonna get pregnancies when you and Trig? As far as we know, y'all ain't even had sex. So I'm not sure what's going on with that." And she was like, "You know, people love you know a politician that has a baby on the way." And even though her and Trig's relationship is strictly for the public, he tends to be somewhat transparent with her. He doesn't told her everything just like she hasn't told him everything about her because we all know you know maybe baby girl like men and women but we definitely know she likes women but um he asked her if she wants to be for real and was she hitting on him and she <laughs> and she eagerly lets him know that he's not her type but he's growing on her and we all know what that means and I understood exactly because I've, you know, dated people where they initially they were not my type. But because I spent time with them and because, you know, we were able to find out we had some similarities. It's like, oh, OK, well, you ain't you ain't that bad. You know, it you that's what it when, when they start to grow on you like that. And as she walks out, she caresses his face and tells him to stop blushing. I ain't even going to hold y'all. I wouldn't be mad. I wouldn't be mad. If something happened with them, they look absolutely beautiful together. All that melanin. I'm here for it. If, you know, if Trig ever want to dip into that honey pot. So, <laughs> let me leave that alone. Anyway, moving on. Kevin, Lene, and Simone. So, Kev's team wins the tournament. And he calls Simone and Lene his good luck charm. His good luck charm. Simone tells him that Lene is more so like his coach. And Kevin wasn't feeling that, you know, initially, but he quickly changed his perspective and he agreed to give Lene 20% of his earnings. And Simone wanted to go and watch the moon. She was so excited because it was a full moon. She just wanted the, the, the energy to be positive. And even though Simone is different, she is a sweetheart. And I love the fact that she doesn't, she did not get swayed by Lene's attitude. And at the end of the night, they end up, you know, like, you know, we cool now. Even though Lene was like, you know, she she isn't on, you know. But I, I, I like Simone. I think she's really, really sweet. So Trig shows up to Fatima's house unannounced and expected to be let in. But homegirl had company. And Trig acted like <laughs> he was hurt. And as she so eloquently told him, we are not exclusive. And they are not. And they are free to see whoever. And Fatima asked if they could talk tomorrow. Trig told her he would be busy, which we know, you know what I'm saying? He said that out of a place of, you know, he just hurt or whatever it's in his feelings. And um, he was like, I'm going to be busy. And she was like, well, maybe some other time. And Trig didn't like that. Trig did not like the fact that she said that. I was like, but what did you expect her to do? You didn't call. You didn't text. You just popped up at her house. No, sir. So Fatima went back in her house to entertain her guests and, you know, Trig walked to his car. And my whole thing is, my whole thing is this. 
What I do respect about Fatima, and I don't know everything about, you know, homegirl just yet, but what I do respect about her is that from the very beginning, she let him know that I know how to keep a secret, but I'm not going to be one, period. You know what I'm saying? So I, I have to respect that, that she was being perfectly honest with him. So we get to the concert. And Maisha is backstage. Gemma goes to give her some words of affirmation and encourage her, let her know, you know what I'm saying, that she got it. She's going to do great. So we see um, Papa and Bakari walk in, and he's already on one. So I knew it was going to be some mess. He gets into it with the security. He gets into it with the guy behind him. Papa ends up playing, paying for him to get in. So Bakari sees Lene and was instantly attracted to her. I'm like, I don't never remember seeing him smile so much. Um, causing him to ask Papa who she was, in which Papa tells him that she doesn't want you. But remember, I think Papa has a little crush on um, J- um Gemma, on Lene as well. So when they walk up to her, um, Papa does introduce them, and he tells her that he likes her braids. So Gemma comes out and thanks them for coming, and she introduces herself to Bakari, who looks like he liked what he saw with her too. I just don't think Bakari is used to being around girls. You know what I'm saying? So it looked like he was attracted to Lene. It looked like he was attracted to Gemma in that sparkly, that sparkly pink outfit she had on. So as Maisha is finishing her performance, Bakari gets into it with the security again. And he ends up firing two shots in the air. Papa grabs Gemma's hand, but she ends up being knocked down. Everyone at this point is running. Of course, that's to be expected. And as she was on the ground, she got trampled over a few times. So once things cleared, we saw Lene, Papa, and Maisha um, run to her aid. And I knew in that moment what was the fate of her and Jake's baby. I was already getting emotional. I ain't gonna lie. I was already getting emotional. I'm like, this this is it. This is, this is how this ends with their child. So we get to the hospital. Jake, Papa, Maisha, and Lene are there. Marcus shows up and he is demanding to see his daughter. He stops a doctor who tells them that Gemma is stable. Um, Jake, you know, inquires about the baby and the doctor lets him know that the baby didn't make it. And Jake is pissed, angry and upset, which he should be. Marcus goes to see uh, Gemma and Jake asks the crew what happened. And Papa states that he doesn't know, but Maisha reveals everything. And Jake turns to Papa to confirm that, you know, I told you, but Car went, basically he will not bought nothing. And he then goes in to see Gemma. And it was just really, really sad. It was a very emotional scene. And he sits down and, you know, he touches her hand and she apologizes to him for losing their baby and that she should have stayed home. And he tells her that she has nothing to be sorry for. He gets in the bed and he holds her tightly as she cries. That, you know, that was such a touching scene. It really was. It was just a touching scene. And as someone who has been through something similar, I cannot imagine the emer- the emotional turmoil this will have on both Jake and Gemma going forward and how they will maneuver through life while experiencing the level of hurt pain and loss that they are experiencing like I couldn't imagine going through this as a teenager you know what I'm saying like I I really couldn't and um it was just it was just so sad and Marcus was there you know just watching and it, it was it was a sad moment like it really really was a sad moment and I know that a lot of people you know don't like Jake don't like Jim when they call him Jake the snake you know, but for me, I've, I've always liked Jake and, Jake and Jim. I've never disliked them. And I've always extended grace for what they did. So many people can't get over what they both did to Kevin. And I do understand that the way that Gemma and Jake got together was jacked. You know what I'm saying? That people wanted Jake to dog her out, to do her dirty. Oh, he don't really like her. He just want to have sex. And I think the writers of this show have done a remarkable job to show that even though, yes, how they got together was foul, but this is someone that he actually cares about, possibly even loves. Like, we've never seen Jake be with a girl this long. Like, he is very much protective of her, very much, you know, cares about her. And I'm so glad that we were able to see, to me, to see him in a different light. And so even as, you know, the next scene where, it's not the very next scene, but we see 
uh, Shad and Trig who were filling each other in on their day when Jake walks in the house and he's clearly upset and he's crying. They ask him what's wrong and what happened, but he can't even ma- he can't even manage to get the words out. And Trig hugs him as he cries. I don't think we've ever seen Jake emotional like this. You know what I'm saying? He wanted to be a father so badly. It just wasn't time and it just wasn't, you know, in the cards for him and Gemma to bring forth life. You know what I'm saying? I just think that like seeing this transformation of Jake and just seeing him, you know, allowing his brother to console him, allowing himself to be consoled. I think it was big. I think that was big on Jake's part because we're not the only person we really ever see him soft around is his mom and Gemma. Like that's that's really it. So Jake waits until Bacardi um, shows up and he immediately begins to beat his ass. I mean, as soon as he steps in the house. And, you know, he lets Bacardi know that because of him, him and his girl lost their baby and that he hates him. And Bacardi, you know, he he did seem remorseful. He was like, you know, man, I didn't know, which is true. And we know it wasn't his intention to cause an uh, this. We didn't know. We know it wasn't his intent for that to happen. But Bakari is always doing something destructive to himself and to those around him. He's one of those those people that it's like you you want to see them change you want to see them do better and I know his backstory has to be one of extreme pain since he has no one you know what I'm saying but it's like at the same time it doesn't give you the right to just go out here and just jack up other people's lives or do things that can possibly cause harm to other people so we see Bakari goes to Papa's house and ask him if he can stay and Papa tells him, yes, you know, he lets him in. And then we see Gemma and Marcus. She's back at home and she's in her bed and, you know, she's still crying. And, you know, she asks her father to stay with her and he does. And he he consoles her and they're both crying, you know, at this time, you know. Um, and baby, the last scene of the episode did it for me. It broke me down. Marcus closed the door as he walked into his office and he just let those tears fall. And as a parent, to not be able to heal what's broken with your child, you have no ability to take away their pain or provide any type of solace that is crippling. You know, his daughter is experiencing a type of pain that he has no power to make better. And, you know, I'm just like, I know he was, he was mourning the loss of his first grandchild. He was, you know, crying because his daughter is hurt and there's nothing he can do about it. Like I felt Marcus in that scene, you know, so, so well, because it's like, how do you function when you are in a position where you're helping all these other people, you know, in the community, but with your, with your daughter, this is something that you don't have the humanistic ability to make right to make better you know what i'm saying to make it okay so you know all in all this was a, a to me a great episode i enjoyed it immensely um i know it, it seemed like time going by so fast and we only got three more episodes left yeah three more episodes left this season but i'm looking for no do we i think so dang I ain't even think about it till I just said it. <laughs> Cause this was episode seven. Yeah. Yeah. So we have three more episodes left. Dang. I love the shot. I really do. I love the shot. Um, thank you guys for listening. I appreciate you. Um, I appreciate the comments. I appreciate you liking, sharing all that other good stuff. I appreciate you appreciate you guys so much. So until next time, I will holler at y'all later. When? <laughs>